So in this video, I'm going to talk about a few things you can do to improve the performance of your Hacks Flixel game. Now, Hacks Flixel is already a really performant game engine, but if you want to squeeze out some extra performance, here are a few tips and tricks that you can implement to make your game work really well. I can't take all the credit for this. These tips are written by Claudio, who is the developer of a game called Super Cute Alien. I'd highly recommend you check out this game. It's one of the bigger games made with Hacks Flixel, and this is what it looks like. Unfortunately, at the time of recording this video, the Hacks Flixel forums are down, so you can't view the thread that he posted, but Wayback Machine is your friend, and I'm going to put a link to this in the description of this video. Okay, now let's run through his eight performance optimizations. The first one is to use less dynamic rotation scaling, alpha and color changes. So this might seem quite obvious, but when you're building a game, it's easy to just add more and more of these in. This is his exact quote. And at the beginning of his post, he mentioned, if you're able to get your game running a smooth 60 in HTML5, then it's gonna work well on mobile and any desktop platform. So that's a kind of good benchmark to hit. But if you can, try to reduce the amount of dynamic alpha changes, rotations, scaling, and color changes. There are ways to have these effects, but not have them dynamic. And I'm gonna go through a few of those in this video. One of those things is to use baked rotations if you need them. Baked rotations are supported in Hackspixel with this load rotated graphic method, which is in the FLX sprite class. And the way this method works is you give it a graphic, the rotations you want, and a few other settings. And what it does is it will pre-rotate your sprite for you so that when your game is playing and you have these rotations happening, these effects happening, they're not being done on the fly by the engine. They've already been done, which will increase the frame rate of your game. The next thing to consider is not to preload all your assets at once. Now, if you're new to Hackslixel, you probably don't know that the engine automatically preloads all your assets. So all your images, your sounds, your music. So here is Claudio's comments, and I'm not gonna read it verbatim, but what I've mentioned before is pretty much what he says. Now here you can see there's a link to a good article, and the good article, unfortunately, is quite old and doesn't work anymore with his link. But of course, with Wayback Machine, you can get access to this article, but it's quite old and it doesn't really apply to modern day Hacks Flixel. However, you're still welcome to look at it. I'll put a link in the description. If you want to see a good example of preloading assets in Hacks Flixel, I'd recommend you check out the Friday Night Funking repo. It's quite a popular game and it uses some good techniques to preload its assets. Of course, the game has a lot of music and it'll be quite annoying if the engine loaded all the music up before the game even started. So there are some techniques to load up the relevant song when it's needed and cache the song after it's been loaded. This technique is only used for HTML5, which makes me assume that the preloading works really well for desktop targets. The next point is that not everything needs to be refreshed at game frame rate. So if you have a game running at 60 FPS, not all the assets need to be refreshed at that refresh rate. Claudio gives an example of some assets that are off screen that he needs to come back later, but he puts them in a separate method that he updates 10 times every second instead of 60 times, which of course saves processing power and will increase your frame rate. The next point is you can use the update call to reduce the amount of refreshes. So I've mentioned here in the previous point that Claudio used a separate method to reduce the amount of times certain assets are updated. But if you have a whole scene or a whole sprite that you want to reduce the amount of times it updates, you can actually change the update method that you overwrite in the game. So as you can see in this comment down here, you can have the super.update and half the amount of time the elapsed value is called. So essentially, instead of updating your scene or your sprite 60 times per second, you can cut it down to 30 or even 15. This saves CPU cycles and the performance overall. This is a screenshot of a game that I'm making and I use that exact same technique 
to reduce the amount of times the prompt in my game is refreshed and updated. The sixth point is to destroy unused sprites to save memory. Again, if you're new to Hackspixel, you're probably not sure of this destroy method and it's quite useful in sprites to get rid of a sprite once you're done with it. But once a sprite has been destroyed, you cannot call it back. So that is the way you can save memory. Once you have a, an enemy or, or something you want off screen that you want to be wiped and removed from memory, this is the best way to do it. Bear in mind, you can't call it back after it's been destroyed. The way to get around that is point seven, to use the revive method. Now, the way the revive method works is that you have to kill a sprite. So if you use the kill method, you can bring it back with revive. So that doesn't save as much memory as destroy does. But the benefit of having the kill and revive technique is that you're not creating new sprites on the fly. When you set your screen, you should create all the sprites that you're ever going to have in, in your scene and you just kill them and revive them depending on what's going on. So I can give you an example without showing you any code. I have a game that I'm making and in this game, you can throw an object. There are some sprites, some really small sprites to direct the player where the object that you throw is going to land before the player has thrown it so they know if, if they want to throw it. Now these objects, these sprites, they are only created once in the whole game, but they're killed and revived based on whether the player wants to throw an object or not. And their position will change based on where the player position is. And that technique is better for performance because I'm not creating new sprites and destroying them all the time. I already have my sprites. I'm just killing and reviving them whenever I need them. Eighth and final point is that not everything needs a collision method or an overlap method. So collision and overlap methods are quite complex. And if you can get away with just checking the Y or X position of a sprite to see if it overlaps with another, you should do that. Now I'm gonna say for this specific performance improvement and for all the other improvements, but for this one in particular, you should only apply it if you're having issues hitting 60 FPS. If your game is running fine, don't worry about this too much. I say that because the collision and overlap methods are really useful and it is much more effort to manually check the position of your sprite than it is to apply the collision or overlap method. But of course, it depends on how your game is performing. If it's performing badly, then go ahead and look into this technique. If it's fine, then I wouldn't bother. And that is it. I hope you've learned something by watching this and you found this video helpful. If you have, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel and stay tuned for more videos like this.